Well, a pleasant uh, good morning to all of you. Um, it is always a pleasure when we can uh, come together and worship God together. And I appreciate the invitation and uh, the elders asking me to come and preach. And uh, again, um, Aside from God sending his son, uh, this is the greatest blessing that God has bestowed on man, uh, the kingdom that his son bled and died for. Because everything that separates us in the world, in the kingdom of God, all of that is removed. And so in the kingdom, there's no rich or poor or black or white. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. That is what the world needs, right? The world needs the kingdom. And so I am grateful that you exist in this area. I drive for, a, I drive a bus for VTA and I do the 71 line and I usually drive by here. Uh, it's usually late at night. Um, but I always am encouraged every time I see the building because everyone needs the gospel. And so God bless you in uh, being a light in this community and um, continuing to serve God. Well, we as Americans were blessed to live in a free country. And in our country, we are blessed to elect the leaders of the people. Uh, we, the people, decide uh, who our next leaders are going to be. And that means that as Americans, you have a, a voice in who you want to lead this country. Now, the idea of politics and voting has caused controversy among the brotherhood of uh, some Brethren believing that Christians shouldn't vote. And the reasons that I've heard is, well, the, uh, the brethren in the first century didn't vote, right? Their leaders were just bestowed upon them, and so we shouldn't vote. And there are people who say, well, Christians have no business being involved in politics because politics is a very dirty, slimy business. And so you should stay out of politics, you should stay out of war, uh, military service, all of those things. And that may be your, your belief today. And if that is what you believe, you're my brother or sister in Christ, so I'm not going to tell you to violate your conscience. Uh, it is my opinion that uh, we have, we've been blessed by God to vote, and so exercise that opportunity to vote. Um, I don't think it's a sin to vote or to be involved in those things, because if you read the Bible, uh, the prophet Isaiah and Ezekiel, they prophesied around the same time, but they were in two different regions. Isaiah was essentially a politician. He was involved in politics. He was involved in the way things operated. Daniel, as the brother just read, right, even though he was taken into Babylonian captivity, he was what you would consider a politician. He was involved in politics. But those individuals still managed to keep their, their focus and thoughts and belief and trust in God. And so I think you can do that. And so in about 14 or 15 days, we're going to have our presidential election. And in about 14 or 15 days, one of the two candidates are going to win, either Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. Now, I don't know where your political allegiance lies, and I don't mean to be offensive when I say this, but I don't really care, because that's not important to me. Whether you support Donald Trump or whether you support Kamala Harris, doesn't matter to me because that's not going to keep you out of heaven. What does matter to me, though, is how we as Christians respond to it. Paul, when he's 
writing to the Christians in Corinth, he tells them that they still have to live in the world, but not to be of the world. And if you know anything about the city of Corinth, it was a very, uh, nobody wanted to be known as a Corinthian. Because if you were known as a Corinthian, you were known as a playboy without morals. <laughs> when I lived in the South, and I was moving to go to Florida College, the preacher that I was studying with said, hey, when you tell people you're from California, they're not going to be too happy about that. <laughs> and he was right. Right? They look at you weird because you're from California, and they think you're some hippie or some far out individual, whatever the case is, right? And that's how it was in Corinth. But Paul tells them, regardless of that, you still got to navigate. You live in Corinth, you can't move. So you've got to find a way to, even though there may be all of these things around you, you still have to navigate and be a Christian. You can't be a hermit. You can't be like these Buddhist monks that live isolated from the world. That's not what God called you to do. So the elections are coming up. And some of you are passionate about whatever candidate. But the reality is, folks, whether you are passionate about Kamala Harris or passionate about Donald Trump, once the election is over, both of them can't win. One is going to win. So you're either going to be profoundly happy or extremely disappointed. That's okay. But after it's all over, how do we respond? Well, regardless of which candidate wins or loses, we need to remember we are living in a nation of men. And we need to be reminded and we need to place our trust in God. Because in the end, it is God who establishes leaders. And that truth was given in the days of Daniel. Now, the brother read there from Daniel uh, chapter 4, <clears throat> and he jumped ahead there, and, and I, that was done on purpose. Uh, at this time, in Daniel's life, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. And at this time, Babylon is the most powerful nation on the planet. And so King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And in this dream, there's this tree. And this tree grows. And it, 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 it is so high that it reaches to heaven. And it is so majestic that every nation, it, it can be seen on every corner of the earth. The trees grows these powerful branches with these beautiful leaves. And animals come to gather under it, and birds of all kinds come onto it. And as Nebuchadnezzar is having this dream, this angel of the Lord appears, and he orders the tree to be chopped down. But the stump remains, and then the angelic watcher says, put a hedge around the stump. Now, a hedge is just a, a, a protector, like a fence. So Nebuchadnezzar... Is perplexed by this dream. And so Daniel comes to him and Daniel says, I will interpret the dream, right? The Lord will give me the ability to interpret this dream. And, and Daniel essentially tells him, he says, you're going to lose your power. He says, that tree represents you. You are a powerful tree that all nations subdue to you. But you're going to lose that power. And you're going to become like an animal. Your hair is going to grow long. You're going to be soaked by the dew. And you're going to have long nails like an eagle. And Daniel tells him, you need to humble yourself or this is going to be you in 12 months. So one day Nebuchadnezzar goes out to his veranda and he's looking at all of his majesty and he says, man, look at how great I am. There is no nation or no king more powerful than me. And then God came knocking. And he said, you're going to lose all of it. 
and you're going to be like a cow and you're going to be grazing grass and your hair is going to grow long like feathers, like eagle's feathers, and your nails are going to grow long and you're going to be eating grass like a cow. Now, you are a citizen of Babylon. You go out one day, you and your wife, and you say, honey, isn't that Nebuchadnezzar? He's eating grass like a cow. Now, the brother read 34 and 35, and that is after Nebuchadnezzar humbles himself, and he comes to Daniel and he tells Daniel, your God is the one true God. And you want to know a tidbit? That's the last time you ever hear of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because when you get to heaven, don't be surprised if you see Nebuchadnezzar there. Because Nebuchadnezzar, when God humbled him, he realized that he was not as powerful as he was. And that God even tells him, it is I who establish leaders and it is I who give power to the lowliest of men. So while Nebuchadnezzar viewed himself as the most powerful man on the face of the earth, God viewed him as the lowliest of men. That's why God says, beloved, humble yourself. You notice God never says, let me humble you. You know why? If God has to move to humble you, you will not like it. That is why he tells you, humble yourself. We sing a song, and brother, you did a great job singing, man. This, you guys are the most beautiful, your voices are the most beautiful voices I've ever heard singing. Like, I wanted to just stop and listen, but that would not be, that's, a, that's, that's not what God calls us to do. But it's so beautiful. But there's a song that we sing, right? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself. It didn't say, let God humble you. Humble yourself, and he will lift you up. Paul in Philippians says, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed with, uh, uh, in the presence of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being obedient even to the point of de death. For this reason, God has esteemed him and given him a name which is above all names. Jesus didn't esteem himself. God did. Humble yourself. Don't you wish our leaders were like that? Regardless of what party, this truth is also affirmed in the New Testament. In, the, in Romans 13, Paul is writing here, and he's writing to Christians who, unlike us, as I mentioned earlier, didn't have the ability to vote for who their leaders were. So they were living under emperors that wanted to kill them. The Colosseum that existed there, I don't know if many of you, I've never been, but some of you may have, and if you've ever walked into the Colosseum, remember that in the first century, your brethren were there being mauled to death. The Emperor Domitian, you know what he used to do with Christians to light his walkway? He would burn Christians. And that would be his light that he would use to walk his, his uh, porch at night. Now you would think, if you're somebody looking at this, you would say, well, if Paul is going to talk about leaders, then he's going to say, hey, you know what? Rise up and fight against this tyranny because it is wrong. And it is wrong to kill innocent people. And he would say, don't submit to them because they are evil. Instead, he says, every person is to be subject to authority, for there is no authority except from God, and those which are exist are established by God. What? Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? 
Do what is good and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the ones who practice evil. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, Justin, you just said that these Christians were living under very evil people. So why would God give them the authority? And I would say to you, Good question. My answer is, I don't know. I don't know. There are leaders today that I scratch my head. If I had hair, I'd pull it out, but it's all gone. <laughs> but I would scratch my head and say, well, why would this person be in power? You can see how evil they are. Why? Well, I don't know. I'm 45. I'm comfortable with that. I'm not going to waste my time trying to figure it out. But what I will tell you is this. All leaders have a responsibility to protect the innocent and punish the guilty. And just like the leaders of a church have a responsibility to shepherd the flock of God, if you don't do what God expects you to do, you're going to answer to God for it. So, our leaders are supposed to protect innocent people like yourself. They are not supposed to support criminals. They are not supposed to embolden criminals. They are supposed to punish criminals. But if they don't do that, they're going to have to answer to God because God gave them the authority to do it. It is important to remember that neither Kamala Harris or Donald Trump has all authority because all authority has been given to Jesus and Jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority. He didn't say some, he didn't say 90%. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That means whether our leaders recognize who Jesus is or not, it doesn't matter. He has all authority over them. And one day, a day just like this, you're going to get up and it's going to be a normal day. But then all of a sudden, things are going to change because you're going to hear the trumpet sound. And then you will see the majesty of Christ. And there are six billion people on this earth and six billion people will bow. Now you think the king in England, you think, man, that's majesty. And you may have gone there and you may have seen all the majestic things. But when you see Jesus, the majesty in England will pale in comparison to the majesty you will see when Christ returns. And on that day, all people will bow. And a preacher I used to study with said, on that day, there will be no agnostic. There will be no atheists. You will see Jesus and you will bow. All will bow. Even those leaders that think themselves as God will bow. Jesus is over all things. Paul says in Ephesians 1, Verse 20, he is the head of all things, the ruler of all things. Paul tells Timothy that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. There is no king higher than Jesus. There is no lord greater than Jesus. He is the ruler over all the kings of the earth. Now, take out kings and put president prime minister, whatever, same thing. He is ruler over all of them, which goes back to the question, if he's a ruler over all of them, then why aren't they all good? And again, you know the answer. I don't know. I don't. But I know they will have to give an account. Hey, my sister and my, my brother. <laughs> I, I looked at it, I was like, that looks like my brother-in-law. And then I said, that looks like my two handsome nephews and my beautiful sister. Good to see y'all. 
I love my nephews, man. My youngest nephew, Jaden, he loves kisses. So after church, go give him a nice kiss. But good to see y'all. Good to see y'all. Sorry. I just I was like, I was like, that looks just like my brother-in-law. Like, that could be his twin. Man, good to see you guys. These facts are not contingent upon whether be leaders believe it or not. You don't have to believe that Jesus is the Lord. But he is. That's the truth. Our obligation to the truth is either accepted or not. But he is. We also need to trust in God's sovereignty. Trust in God's goodness. Paul in Romans 8, again, talking about all of the bad things that the Christians are going to suffer. They're going to be put to death. They're going to be killed. They're going to be all kinds of things. And he says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. Whatever happens after the election, Understand that God is good and he will always be good. Understand that. And even if your candidate doesn't win, there is still good and you still have a mission to do. And that mission is to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. I am glad on a side note that the Supreme Court shut down Roe v. Wade. I'm glad my sister is here because my youngest nephew, if her doctor had her way, wouldn't be here. But God had a better plan. And my nephew is living proof of it. I'm glad that, it, that the Supreme Court said, hey, you know what? That's up to the states. But even though I am happy, guess what? People still need the gospel. The war hasn't been over. People still need the gospel. You understand? So regardless of what happens, understand that there is good. God is good, and he will cause all things to work for his benefit. God will never forget his children. What shall we, what shall we say then? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but deliver him over for us, how will he not also freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who has raised us at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And let me add, or elections? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all things, we are overwhelmingly conquered through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, Paul. God will never forget his children. No matter what happens, he will never forget his children. And so nothing should separate us from Christ. No matter what our rulers do, whether it be good or bad, we are in God's hands. Well, then our true citizenship, the Christian's True citizenship is in heaven, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this country. There are lots of great things in this country. I, love, I, I was born in Trinidad. My sister and I were in Trinidad. is a beautiful island, lots of beautiful things, great beaches, all of that. But as much as I love this country, love the fact that I was born in Trinidad, these things are not going to last forever. And my citizenship and your citizenship is in a much greater place.
heaven. And that's what we need to remember. Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and in 1 Peter 2 that we are just pilgrims passing through. That's all. We're just passing through here. This is not our permanent home. So do not become attached to the elemental things of this world. Again, you could be passionate about politics. I couldn't because that was overtaking my, my, uh, my obligation and my responsibility as a Christian, so I just tune it out. That doesn't mean that I'm not aware of things, but there are things more important than that. So don't become too attached. If you can balance the, both of them, God bless you. If you can't, choose the better one. Guard against the things of this world, including politics. 1 John 2, beginning in verse 15, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away. Everything has an expiration date, including you. I'm 45. And when I wake up to do a drive a bus, I wake up like, oh, my back hurts. When I get done, I got to get out and walk because I got plantar fasciitis because I sit on a bus all day driving up and down. That's just a reminder, man. Your body is, every day you're getting older. That's, that's God's wake-up call, like, hey, everything that you see, everything that you like, they all, your, your fancy car is going to break down. Your body is going to break down. The clothes, your shoes is going to break down. That means the world is passing away. And if your love is in the world, as it passes away, so will you. So you got to focus on what really matters. When we focus on things of the world, they can render us fruitless. And so as great as this nation is, do not become attached. Our mission is doing the will of God. I was talking to a brother and he's, he was telling me, he said, you know, when you talk to people, you got to talk to them about uh, becoming conservatives. And I said, listen, when I talk to people, I don't care if they're Democrat or conservative. My goal is to bring them to a knowledge of God. I don't care about what your politics are. We can have a discussion on it. But at the end of the day, you're my brother or sister, so I don't care who you vote for. Everybody's got a passion about it. That's great. But at the end of the day, what good is it if I go, hey, man, you're a Republican party, a Republican, and then God says, well, I didn't call you for that, Justin. I called you to bring him to a knowledge of me. So what did you do? What did you do? Now, I love that brother. But he's, he's got it all wrong. I wanted to tell him, man, turn off Fox News and pick up your Bible, dude. <laughs> Just pick up your Bible. I mean, you, you laugh, but that's what I wanted to tell him. Turn off the TV and pick up your Bible and read what God's mission for you is. That's ridiculous, man. That's wasting time on too much elemental things. Doy Moyer, some of you may know him, when I was on Facebook, in the 2016 election, all these people going back and forth, and he's like, if Christians are, t if, you, you waste, if you're spending more time talking about the elections than talking about the Bibles, then you've got your priorities mixed up. He's right. Some of y'all may not want to hear it, but blame Doy Moyer for it. But he's right. 
We do that by seeking him first. Seek, we seek him first, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Seek the kingdom of God first. Focus on God. Remember what Peter says, we, were, we are a royal priesthood. Do you realize that one time you and I were separated from the commonwealth of God? But Christ came and broke down that dividing wall and brought us now near to God? Do you understand what an honor that is? Not just Jews, but all people, whether you're black, white, whether you're from the north or south, east or west, you now have an opportunity to be brought near to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that's, that's great news to me. So as a priesthood, our main focus must be on spreading the gospel. We must make disciples of all nations, regardless who rules in that nation. You guys to support a brother in Kenya. Man, it's about supporting, spreading the word. Regardless of who rules Kenya, who doesn't, it's about spreading the word. That's the mission. Therefore, going, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The question is, are we just as active in saving souls as we are in politics? So what do we owe our leaders? We owe our leaders our submission. Peter says that in 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 13, he says, Submit yourself to the Lord's sake for every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence what? The ignorance of foolish men. So somebody says to you, brother or sister, why do you submit, even though you didn't vote for the person you voted for and he, he or she won, why do you submit? Because God told me to. Be comfortable with that. Be complete in that. God told me to. That's why I do it. To also silence the ignorance of foolish men. Men who would love nothing better to, for, for, uh, for you to get riled up and agitated. God told me to. And keep it moving. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We also owe our taxes. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all that is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, I drive a bus, and I pick up people, young people who, they get on the bus and they smell like alcohol, they smell like weed, and they have a clipper card, and I know they got no job. They have a clipper card and beep, oh, that's the sound of success, I know it works. And I get agitated because I know that me and my fellow co-workers and you, you get out there and you work hard and you work hard and you pay taxes and it's going to people who don't really care. I had one guy get on the bus, he said he was about to lose his phone from the government and he said, these people just need to work more and pay taxes so I could keep my phone on. And man, I was driving that bus and I just got so agitated. But you know what? God didn't say, hey, if you don't like it, don't pay taxes. He says, pay your taxes. Pay it. Remember in Matthew, was it Matthew 21 or 22? The Pharisees come and they say, they send, his, they send their disciples to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we know that you are a man come from God. Tell us, is it lawful to pay a poll tax? Now, a poll tax was a tax designed specifically for Jews. 
And Jews didn't like to pay it because Rome was Babylon, the oppressor. And so they were trying to trick Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, give me a denarii. And he says, whose inscription is that? And they say, well, it's Caesar's. He says, well, then give it back to him. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render to God the things that are God. You know why you pay your taxes? Your soul belongs to God. And God told you to. Does it mean you have to like it? No. But God didn't say, hey, do you like it? Did the Jews like paying a poll tax simply because they were Jews? No. Did Jesus say, well, how dare they? He knew what a poll tax was, and he knew why they were asking it. But he says, give it back to him. Because your soul is more important. You don't want to miss heaven by God saying, why didn't you pay your taxes? Well, I didn't like Gavin Newsom, Lord. Well, I didn't ask you that. I just asked you, why didn't you pay your taxes? Well, I didn't like Donald Trump, Lord. I didn't ask you that. Why didn't you pay your taxes? So pay it. May not like it. God doesn't care. Pay it. We also owe them our respect. Titus 3 Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration. For we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, uh, deceived, etc., etc., right? Paul is telling Titus, remind the brethren to be subject to rulers. They are worthy of your respect. Why? God said so. They also need our prayers. First Timothy two. First of all, then I urge that all entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead tranquil and quiet lives in good, uh, goodness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Why? Who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. You want to know why you need to pray to your leaders? God desires them to be saved. You want to know how I know that? Paul just said it. But in your free time, read Ezekiel 18. Read that entire chapter. And you will get an insight to how God views man. God desires no one to go to hell. That is why, side note, you should never wish anyone hell. Because hell was not designed for you. Hell was designed for Satan and his minions. And I honestly believe that if God were to give us, brother, just two seconds, just two, of what hell is, we would want no one to go there. So don't wish that. Let's say Donald Trump wins and you are agitated. Don't wish the man hell. Wish him God. Pray that he comes to a knowledge of God. If Kamala Harris wins and you don't like it, don't wish her hell. Wish her God. And pray that they come to a knowledge of God like Nebuchadnezzar in our story. And they recognize that their power comes from a great and merciful God, and they govern the way God wants them to govern. Is that hard to do? Sure. Is it impossible? No. You know how I know? Paul wrote it down. Everything that is written in this book, we can all do. If it wasn't, God would have never put it there. We must not fail in our responsibilities. Political differences do not give us the right to speak ill of our leaders. That is why I got off of Facebook, one of the many reasons. Because it wasn't becoming of me the things I would say. I wouldn't say anything vile or crass, but it just served no purpose. Even those who are immoral. We just read Romans. Those emperors were immoral. But Paul says, pray for them, 
pay your taxes. One teacher that I used to study with, you know how the brother was given his announcements? He said, just think you're in the first century and they get up and they say, you know, brother, sister, so, uh, brother and sister so-and-so, they're not with us this morning because last night they were killed in the Colosseum. That's what your first century brethren were dealing with. But pray for the leaders. Pray for them. We must not fail to do these things. Remember, there are limits to our liberty. We are free. But we're not free to act stupid. We've come to our senses, so we need to act in that manner. Over the next four years, will we be committed to giving our leaders the respect that is due them? We serve the Prince of Peace, beloved. And his death established peace between God and man. And we are commanded to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what? Sons of God. You want to be a son of God? Be a peacemaker. We accomplish that by loving our enemies. You have heard it said, Jesus said, love your enemies. Love, uh, love those who love you, right? And hate your enemies. But I say to you, and the reason that Jesus said that is because the Pharisees would say that. Hey, love those who love you, but hate your enemies. And Jesus said, what good are you doing? It's easy to love people who love you. Because they love you right back. He said, love your enemies. Pray for them. Bless those who persecute you. Because he causes the sun and the rain to fall on both the good and bad. You know, God blesses those who hate him. Goes back to my question earlier, right? Why? I don't know. I don't care. I'm glad he does. And we display wisdom from above. Wisdom on the earth, James says, is foolishness. But wisdom from above are those who practice peace. That's how you do wisdom from above. We should contend without being contentious. Are we peacemakers at a time when there is discord? Or do we cause division with our rhetoric? Dee Bowman used to say, man, I wish I had a shotgun. I'd shoot that clock. But look, I appreciate your patience. Thank you very much. Good to see all of you again. Good to see my family back there. Good that you're all here. Good to see my spiritual family here. And again, you may all have your different political uh, persuasions and you're probably counting down the days or you've probably already voted and hey, that's great. But understand, Satan is very active. And Satan used a pandemic to divide brethren and it divided brethren because I heard from brethren. I had lunch with brethren who faced division because of either side, mask or no mask they were on. And Satan loves those things, folks. Peter says he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You ever watch them nature shows? How the lions, when they look at the gazelles and they find the weakest one, and when they find the weakest one, they say, I got him, and they jump on him. Peter says, that's how Satan is, man. He's always looking. When he can find something, he says, okay, I know people are passionate about this. I'm just going to slowly insert that poison. And he loves nothing better than to divide people, mask or no mask, COVID shot or no COVID shot, Republican or Democrat, Kamala or Trump. Why, he, just, he just loves it, and he loves when brethren lose focus. So before and after the election, we must remember to think these are five R's. One, renew our trust in God's sovereignty. Reaffirm our heavenly citizenship. Refocus on our primary mission. Resolve to give our leaders the respect that is due them. And resume our role as peacemakers.
I'm not perfect in this, folks, but God is good, and I've come a long way in my life. Made a lot of foolish mistakes, did a lot of foolish things. But most importantly, I wasted a lot of time because Satan grabbed a hold of me and he had me focus on the wrong things. And as I've gotten older, I realize those things are not important. See my sister and her family here. There are things that we disagree on. But you know what? When I look at my sister, I'm like, man, I'm proud of my sister. She's a beautiful woman, got two great kids. On a side note, I don't know how those kids came from my brother-in-law and sister. <laughs> I love them. But I look at them like, man, I'm just proud of her. Like, whatever, it, the things of the world, that doesn't matter. I just love my sister and I love my nephews. I love my brother-in-law. And I love you regardless of what political aisle you're from. I don't care. I love you because we are bonded by something greater than Democrat or Republican, American or not. We are bonded by the blood of Christ. Amen. That's all that matters. And when you get to heaven, it's not going to be Republicans here and Democrats there and independents over there. We're all going to be one and we're all going to see God and Jesus in all of his glory. And we're all going to sing together. One of the prophets talks about God singing to his people. I want to say Malachi, but I could be wrong. My apologies. You ever wonder what God's singing voice is like? I do. And to think of God singing to us. Now, I want you to think about that. We are not perfect people. We fall short of God's glory. Maybe not every day, but we fall short of God's glory. We are imperfect people, yet in that prophet, he says, I long to sing to my people. Isn't that awesome? That's the leader that we serve. A God who is abundant in loving kindness and mercy. He is slow to anger, quick to forgive. Regardless of what happens after the election, God is still the same. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's who you serve. If you are not a Christian, your soul is not alive. God wants to animate your soul and make you his child. And you will be part of a kingdom where all of the segregation is removed. I was preaching in Mississippi a while ago, and this guy lived in the northern part of Mississippi. Now, this is... Mississippi folks and he went down south to buy something and the lady down south said we don't serve Yankees <laughs> You live in the same state But you know what that's life People do that But in the kingdom all of that is removed. Don't you want to be a part of that? if as a child of God if you have let the things of this world outweigh your love for God. And as the brother leads us in the song, man, you ask God to help you and he will help you. If you need the help of your brethren, then come forward and let us pray for you. Whatever your need is, we as God's people are here to help you in any way. As together we stand, together we sing.